You're listening to the Pagan Centered Podcast, bringing unique and intelligent perspective to the masses using contemporary technology, allowing for free discussion of one's personal beliefs and enlightenment of those not familiar with a particular religion. We bring to the forefront many issues that are ignored or shunned upon by mainstream religion. We discuss topics on a religious and non-religious level as they relate to our panel representing varied belief systems. Our brute honesty and candid opinion has made us one of the longest-running and most popular pagan podcasts. Feel welcome to call in live or submit listener feedback via our website, PaganCenteredPodcast.com. One, and welcome to this episode of PTP, the Pagan Centered Podcast. I'm Dave. I'm I'm Amber. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, did Ashley just say she was Amber? <laughs> that's what I heard. First point. <laughs> we from Voltron occasionally. Vulcan mind meld. You might want to pull up the Google Docs, Ashley. <laughs> Well, I'm Brandon, if uh, Ashley and Amber uh, figure out who is who. I'm scurving. I'm thinking about turning the, out the uh, After Hours feed into a blooper speed. <laughs> <laughs> Why the hell not? Also joining us tonight are... I'm Barrett. I'm Miles. I'm Peter. I'm Snooze. And I'm Star. All right. Tonight we are talking about working with non-human entities. So there's uh, working with gods, and then there's working with ghosts, but then everybody really talks about the in-between, unless you're a third-degree initiate, and we're like, yeah, fuck all that. None of us are, well, none of the regular hosts are initiated into any kind of oath-bound tradition that prohibits us from talking about it, so we're going to talk about it after these messages. And we're back, and before we talk about this exhilarating metaphysical topic, let's talk about discussing metaphysics. <laughs> <laughs> have a discussion about discussing metaphysics. Um, <laughs> so Scurvy made the observation that pagans are really uptight when it comes to talking about metaphysics, and he's asking, why is this the case? And I think this is a good discussion to have on air. So why is this the case? I really think that they are afraid of talking about metaphysics because everyone who wears a pagan hat will at some point be asked about metaphysics and they don't want to admit that they don't know as much as they think they know or they want to they don't want to be challenged on what they know in case they can't answer the challenge and so they play dumb and mute and they pretend that it's a non-discussable topic I I personally think go ahead Brandon, go ahead Sorry, I was going to say, I personally think that a lot of people are scared of looking stupid and yeah. crazy. It's like, <coughs> sorry, um, a lot of people think that metaphysics is like Harry Potter stuff and, you know, the movie magic type deal. And right. I know with a lot of people, if you're not very comfortable with it, doing it and then talking about it, within open groups and not knowing exactly who who does what and what is acceptable and so on and so forth. I mean, I think there's a lot of nervousness there. I mean, it's safe to talk about your faith path, but not necessarily what you do in ritual or in metaphysics work, whichever it happens to be. And something I've encountered as well is that sometimes... People ask me, once I learned that I'm pagan, they ask me some really specific micro-analyzing question that I'm supposed to give this huge encyclopedic brilliant answer to, and if I don't answer the way that they think I should be answering, because they assume since I'm pagan I know everything, everything, everything about everything pagan, then the answer that I try to provide is points to them, and they're like, oh, well, he's nothing. He doesn't know his crap. And some people are afraid of being pigeonholed that way. Kind of like the chick that asked us the other week about, uh, you know, oh, this is what happened with a ritual with the, the broken mirror, and yeah, what is it? Well, Well, we can guess, but we weren't there, so we can't offer specifics. 
Right. And I think some of it, you know, there's there's all of that. And then going on what Brennan talked about, feeling crazy, there's so, it's such a wide realm and there's so much that is not known about it, partially because it's not discussed. And I wonder how much it's not even outside of the community, like you're you're talking to somebody from a church in a discussion or even a family member. Yeah, it sounds crazy to people who are not in the the circles, but even at different paying it events, it's such a hush hush ooh, don't you know, we don't we don't want to talk about it. And I think it still boils down to there's so much that just kind of makes you feel crazy in society today you're told you you know plants don't have feelings animals don't have emotion and personality none of this is real none of this is right and if you do you're just schizophrenic you're hearing things you know there's the complete opposite movement where there's no such thing as schizophrenia they're all touched people with Asperger's and autism they don't really have problems they're just special and you have these two extremes and nobody likes to take the middle route and say well sometimes it is mistaken for schizophrenia and sometimes it isn't sometimes it's real when you take the middle ground and understand where both sides are coming from and put it into something real, for some reason it becomes really, really scary to some people. Well, I, I think I think this is really interesting as far as, you know, one thing, you know, in regular mundane society, you try to hide metaphysics because it's such a, it's not a taboo tub subject so much as it's that, oh my God, I'm a freak type of label. You know, <laughs> like coming out as a furry in public, you know, it, it's, it's nothing wrong with being a furry. <laughs> But there's a lot of negative crap that goes with that, a lot of negative baggage. That's a range of reason left over. Yeah, but but when, like, like say, you know, Pagan Spear Gathering is a perfect example. People will just walk up to you and start talking some really deep metaphysical stuff, and there is no, there is no defensive posturing from the, at least with the people I was talking to, that I had, I don't even know who they were, and I still don't know who they are. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's really interesting to just pull them ball aside and everybody's just like okay well let's have an interesting metaphysical discussion and it's not okay well i don't quite see it that way but i can i can definitely see you you know how you can you know that's that's what you want to believe okay you know there is no i'm better than you or my fact is better than your fact you know it, it's just people talking and i i just like that i just like it when people just pull the, the baggage aside and you just have a good discussion but the thing is trying to get people into that mindset is very difficult because when you're in mundane society, you know, again, you're, the problem is you're in mundane society. Any idiot off the street can just walk into that conversation, and they can just make crap up. And we, we've gotten so used to people just walking in and making crap up, we are very defensive about this. Mm -hmm. I think you run in – I run into it too, not in, the, not in the mundane world, but even in – sometimes in places – at a festival where you expect things to be a little more at home there. And I think part of that, there, there are people that have made the term UPG, unsubstantiated person or unverifiable personal gnosis, into a bogeyman and a dirty word without necessarily really looking at how someone might be handling it or how they might be vetting it. And that is possible to a certain extent. Okay, I'm going to do an experiment here real quick I'm going to close my eyes and I would like you to explain sight to me hmm it's your brain's interpretation of the light waves hitting your cornea okay open your mm -hmm. eyes <laughs> <laughs> there we go I just, <laughs> I just got that sorry um, it's a way of, it's, it's like feeling the difference between hot and cold or hard and soft, but without actually touching things, it's a distance perception of items around you. Okay. I'm a big believer in keep, keeping things, keeping things simple. I'm also a huge believer in reusing heuristics when possible. 
Heuristics are rules of thumb for those people that don't know 12 dollar words. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Not a 12 dollar word, it's a technical term. Yeah, well. You get 13, 15 change with that one. <laughs> Sweet. We getting rich tonight. But that aside, that's <clears throat> whenever anybody talks about experience and, and there's differences in what people say, especially when it's the whole uh, atheists get me with this a lot, by the way, but I like running that experiment by them. And one day I would love to meet a blind atheist just to get their <laughs> view on it, although I'm thinking I might get a little bit owned. But that's and okay. An example I sometimes use is that I'm talking to a friend who knows games like WoW or EverQuest or one of those online games, and somebody else joins into the conversation as well who doesn't know anything about the game or the game mechanics or game details, and my friend starts rattling off about this talent and that skill and these animals and this spell process and things, and the person they're talking to is just completely out of their element, and they can't comprehend what the person is talking about. What um, I've and useful is to first establish some kind of a common bond, someplace they have a foothold in understanding what you're talking about, and then use that and elaborate on that, and then um, build up on the interpretations as they become more familiar with them. You know, one reason I don't like talking metaphysics, and, and it's kind of what Miles said there, is, you know, if you don't have a common frame of reference, that's a long conversation. <laughs> I mm -hmm. mean, it's it's just... And I think, I think honestly, yeah. I mean, that's where the, the degree system makes a lot of sense when it comes to metaphysics. Because, you know, yes, you come into, let's say you come into, I hate saying paganism, because that, then that means that all paganism just centers on metaphysics, and that's not the case. I mean, paganism is about religion. But, you know, you come into metaphysics blind, essentially, or you maybe, maybe you've stumbled upon a few gifts, and you kind of got that lead edge, but at the still same time, you don't have that common ground with others, and that's where, you, you know, your first degree is establishing your, your, your common ground, and then from there, it's about, okay, now you know the basics, now let, let's let's work beyond it now come up with your own concepts and we can communicate based on this common ground language we've introduced you to I have a atheist friend of mine and a while ago him and I were talking uh, about a similar topic and he, he's a very hardcore atheist now the part that amused me was later on in that day he said I had a feeling about that <laughs> Good. So I asked him to explain to me how he managed to acquire some form of input via non-caloric means. There was no heat exchange in that. There was no light huh. moving. There's how this happen? <laughs> well, for him, does being atheist means he doesn't believe in God, but that does not exclude him from a possibility of believing in metaphysics or the paranormal. He believes people are walking robots. Okay. Well, then he believes in sci-fi. <laughs> no, no, I mean, like, for, like organic machines. Oh, like, we are. There's yes. He, no yeah, he doesn't will. believe in... It's all input, output, behavioralism. As my brother, as well, believes that we are all just bags of walking chemicals, and that the thought process is just like electricity in the brain, and that after you die, the, the chemical processes cease, and the body rots, and that's the end of it. There is no afterlife, there is no God, there is no soul. That's all things we've made up as ways to try to explain things we can't comprehend. It's all crap, he says. But anyway. So, that right there is just... Just my little pet input. That pet input on us. Uh, talk today. 
I think right. that's actually the largest part of metaphysics. I mean, okay, a ceremonial magician would probably throw something heavy at me for saying that, but that gut reaction, gut instinct, something like you said, had a feeling about it, something's wrong, I know something, da 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 da. I mean, that could almost be like a hindbrain type thing. I think that is, that, that's where you build out from metaphysics. That is metaphysics. Everything else is just a fancy dress. And that doesn't mean it's lesser, but it's, it's that dressed up. You know what? And I wonder if that's not some of the problem, too, is that instead of talking about little things that can be very easy common ground like those feelings, they jumping into the unbelievable and then expecting people to understand? Well, I think, you know, when you go into metaphysics, a lot of people get into, the, they want to share all their really cool experiences and they forget the basic foundation of any discussion, which is the crazier it sounds, the more you're going to have to back up what you're saying. Because these people yeah. don't know you. They don't know how credible you are. So, you, And you're starting with the most incredible information. You gotta start out with some credible, like, you know, not so much credible so much in, in the sense of it is true, more in the sense of believable. And you gotta build I, up your street cred from there. Yeah. I see mm -hmm. that when I teach the class that I do on working with land whites. There are, I, the first exercise is for everyone to choose a, what I call an anchor, and write down, just sit quietly and listen to it. So, you know, listen, so to speak and give me their first impressions, just their gut impressions, whatever those are. And I find that I get at least one or two in every group that wants to come up with this, oh, I sense the, the greatness of the universe and the cosmic force and the love of the God and the goddess and da-da-da-da-da-da-da. And it's this huge, big, drawn-out thing. And they usually wind up being the people that get ticked off in a huff and leave the class early or don't really contribute anything. The people that really wind up getting something out of it and contributing are frequently the ones who have no clue what we're doing, that this is completely new to. And they'll look at it and go, huh, you know, I taste, kind of, it, I taste like lake water, muddy water, or, you know, I feel like I've got mud between my toes or something like that. Something very, very simple, very basic that doesn't require a knowledge, any kind of specialized knowledge or training to get across to someone, to communicate. It's a more personal, ground-based connection. You think? Mm -hmm. I think the highly, the strangely and extreme spiritual is also what people have been really pushing for lately, though, too. So a lot of people, when they go into something, you hear a lot of the New Age crap being spewed where it's, oh, and we're all connected in the great, if we would all just listen, we're all connected. Instead of saying how easy it is to sit in the woods and listen and understand and be connected, they make it seem like when you reach out to a tree, all of a sudden you can see across the cosmos. Well, yeah, and, and, and the one thing I think, and I don't want to go too far down this road, but I think the the one thing to keep in mind with metaphysics is that it is more important what you are feeling and what you believe is right, even if you can't explain why it is wrong. It is better to be truthful to yourself, you know, in the long term when it comes to metaphysics than trying to blend in what you what you think other people should be hearing from you. Yeah, don't be the social chameleon. I mean, if you if you touch a tree and you don't feel a damn thing, you don't feel anything. I mean, yeah. Or if you touch Preacher a brother. tree and you really do feel the eternal cosmos, then that's what you feel. I mean, that sounded unintentionally dirty, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I think Amber's got a lot of that right, though, because it's and and I'm not discounting. I agree with what Dave just said, but I do run into people that completely derail the experience they're trying to have because they're so busy trying to have the experience they think they should be having. Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, 
remember how many times have me and you had metaphysical experiences and we're like, that makes no freaking sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how you know it's a metaphysical experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it, it, it's so hard, you know, to try to build. I, I think of it as like building bridges between people's experiences. You know, when you're when you're hearing someone talk about their experience, sometimes it like resonates with you, but like not in the same way. And it and it takes some time to like work through how what happened to that person relates to what happened to you. And sometimes you have to make some some uh, some interesting connections for that to happen. I'm I'm a I'm a metaphysical skeptic, and I'm I'm odd to be in with. So. So sometimes when I, uh, I I hear metaphysical theories or or especially my poor my poor priestess and priest when they're they're trying to explain something to me like I'm I'm trying to like so hard to work it into how I actually feel that they're like we have no idea how you did that and we're not entirely certain if that's right <laughs> but if it works for you you know and, yeah, if it uh, works for you then it's right for you mm-hmm. right yeah so I mean you know that whole just because you don't have the same experience doesn't mean there's not like some connection there. Sometimes you just have to find it. Mm-hmm. Down with that. What is a non-human entity, it says here? I'm reading the cue notes, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Hang on. Oh. <laughs> Newt Gingrich. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, that was mean. I'm sorry. Wash your mouth out with soap. Well, I mean, you know, non like you hear a lot of people, in, especially on pagan programming, talk about, okay, we're going to work with the gods, or we're going to work with the ancestors today. Um, you know, and, and, and ancestors, you know, whether they be ghosts or just, you know, human ancestors in some way, shape, or form, I mean, that's, that's a common theme that's discussed a lot by people, and so is working with the gods. But I think there's this whole chasm in between of so much stuff that just doesn't get touched. It's like, well, what about all that extra crap that's out there that is not a living human, not a dead human, and not a god? Right. I mean, there's so much extra crap out there. And, and it's just like, you know, it could be anything from, from animal spirits, you know, like we were like was previously uh, dabbled on in discussion. Or it could be something as off the wall as working with the fae. And the thing is, a lot of, I see, like, more and more, it's like, oh, we don't, we don't talk about talk, you know, working with the Fae. I'm like, dude, you are like the sixth tradition I've heard of working with the Fae. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is not a secret thing anymore, okay? <laughs> well, you know, I'll, I'll actually tell you a story about my, my one experience with the Fae. Um, I, uh, I had a, uh, a leprechaun. Uh, and I know this sounds crazy as hell, so I'm just going to go for it and just not look back. So I had a leprechaun <laughs> that lived near me. And um, the leprechaun would, uh, we had a, an outside light that would go off and on uh, at random intervals. But that, that light, when I would wake up in the middle of the night and like need to go to the restroom, like the light would be on and the moment I started to move, the light would go off. Or if I was trying to sleep, the moment I closed my eyes, the light would come on and, and not let me sleep. And it was like, it was like on cue. It was, uh, it was kind of crazy. And so I actually ended up having to work with this leprechaun who was bored as hell. He <laughs> just enjoyed messing with me. That, uh, and that was the one and only time I worked with the Fae. So I ended up having to, to work with him and, you know, uh, interact with him and give him things to do to keep him from just <laughs> messing with me when I'm like, you know, halfway across my bedroom and all of a sudden the light goes out and I run into a table. Um, because he, he, yeah, he that did. sounds about he would, right. He would, he would time these things. And, uh, and I know that sounds crazy, but that was my one and only experience with working with the Fae. Did you give him like a Sudoku crazy. book? Hmm? Did you give him like a Sudoku book to do when he gets bored? <laughs> And give them a ball of yarn to untangle. <laughs> well, no, there, I mean, there's actually cultural and historical precedence for that. It's, I mean, people say, oh, well, it's going to be crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. But it, look at how much folklore you have, how many centuries or even millennia of folklore you have 
where certain things or certain entities or certain behaviors in something unexplained have kept have, have kept on. They've they've had staying power. And I don't think that's necessarily just for the sensationalism of it, especially one of the things one of the things that I like to do is look at things that come up similarly in cultures that did not meet or didn't meet until much later. It if you're gonna have something that recurs that often and has that much staying power then just figuring, well, somebody just made it up and it's ancient urban legend. It, I'm I'm saying do re, you know do some research or whatever. And if it's if it's been around that long, it's not necessarily smart to just blow it off as crazy. You I mean, there's a lot know, of law about leprechauns. Hmm? What was that, Amber? Even native people have all the little people legends. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was about to say. Um, I live near. Uh, uh, a couple of mountains. Near, I live near the Appalachian Trail, actually, and uh, we have the uh, the Nunahai who live on the mountains. Mm-hmm. And the Nunahai, they they feast and they make music, and they they sort of party, and uh, that's what they do. And if someone's lost, they take them in, they give them a bed, they give them food, you know, they give them music, they cheer them up, and send them back on the right way, and. Uh, and they sound very much like the Fae from from Irish tradition, but they're they're not. They're from Cherokee lore. Yeah, and, Cherokee uh, have tons of stories about the little people or the trail people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I actually I've actually heard them before. Um, I thought I thought my neighbors were were being obnoxious with their music, and uh, I, I didn't realize that my neighbors were out of town, and so I was like pissed at them for days because I kept hearing this music up the mountain, and uh, and yeah. I'll stop telling crazy fairy stories. <laughs> oh, would you stop? Please, Star. I got one for you. Now, how about dealing with non-human entities that are not from this dimension and do not have any little folklore you can go to? Because I had this problem in my house. There are these weird trans-dimensional spider things. No idea where they came from. They just randomly popped into my house. I think they got lost. Babylon 5! That's the shadow! <laughs> got the shadow. That's right. Oh, so I got to go to Babylon 5? Crap, I don't want to talk to Jason. I, <laughs> He's going to that show. I haven't found anything yet that did not respond favorably to peanut butter and Nutella. Across the board, doesn't matter what it is, I have not run across, and Miles can back me up on this, I have not run across a single damn thing that did not pony up from peanut butter or Nutella. Honey works, too. What I've found works is just simply sitting down and talking with them. Sometimes a rolled up newspaper. Stop it. No. No <laughs> nomming. <laughs> no. Food, food is the universal no. language. So is That's violence. <laughs> sweet. Food is violence. Let's get primal because everything, ha- <laughs> everything to. has to, to eat. Everything can be hurt if you hit it hard enough with a rolled up newspaper. <laughs> exactly. Some, you have to find a way to communicate your intentions that don't necessarily use words in the language you understand or words at all. It's like, I mean, I primarily wind up dealing with animals that with fancy words don't mean jack to them. Food smells, um, nice things to sleep on, nice things to lay on, things like that are what actually matters to them. It's yeah, it's uh, yeah. It's, I guess it's kind of primal because that's that's the communication that you can go back to that works. It's so, the one that has the least chances for misinterpretation. To clarify all of this, then I'm just thinking off the top of my head here. If if you're alone in a room and you hear someone call your name and you turn around and there's no one there, you're the only person in the room then it's up to you to work out what it was that called your name. Is it, did you imagine it? Is it an invisible person in the room with you? Is it a ghost or is it a, a little person, transdimensional spirit or what? And also, we seem more able to accept the possibility that it is a paranormal presence that called our name than most mainstream 
case would freak out and either call the psychiatrist or an exorcist. Well, it kind of goes with the territory. Exactly. We can because we do because we are. And some of us are, some people actually wind up in, you know, a PHA faith, paganism, heathenry, alternative spirituality, however you want to do it, because they are sensitive to this stuff, which I personally think everybody's a little bit psychic. But a lot of people, that's why, the, that's the whole reason they wound up here. It's not necessarily as much about religion for them as it is about, okay, this is my world. My world does not compute to these people. I need to go over here to these people. Well, you know, back when I was a baby, which, you know, I was trying to reach out and expand my consciousness and all these sorts of things, and I never really had issues with ghosts and stuff before or, or other entities, but I noticed that once I started to, like, reach out and expand my consciousness, people were like, oh, what are you doing? You can see me. And then, like, people would, like, well, not people, but entities would, like, come and visit. And and eventually, you know, at first that was cool, and then it was finally like, you know, I've got to put my foot down. This is my bedroom, and you just kind of need to leave. Um, so I think that happens too. I, I I think I think when you reach out, well, you know, as Nietzsche said, look out into the abyss, and it's looking right back at you. Yeah, and I think that's how most people wind up encountering mm-hmm. non-human entities. So, you know, like you like you put it, the expansion of consciousness, whether you know, regardless of how you do it, that's usually how a lot of people come across these things in the first place. <laughs> And I found that ones that you wind up making friends with and making good with, like I've got a whole bloody house full of them. If I run across something that just can't be dealt with or can't be bargained with or can't reach an agreement with, it, they'll, I, I don't even have to do anything anymore. They'll run it off. They, they've decided, okay, this is our home girl. And it's that, that tell, that makes that, now that even makes some people that are used to metaphysics look at you like you're crazy, but I'm grateful for it. You've got metaphysical watchdogs. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, you know, like, you know, the same basic concepts of friendship apply, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just because they might have a few extra appendages and don't operate on this frequency, that doesn't mean they can't be your friends. Exactly. I mean, you know, you treat people good, they treat you good. If we were all, If the whole world was like that, we'd all be set. I just solved the entire world's problems. <laughs> For you. The world will be okay as soon as we all get along. <laughs> well, there's that line again. The answer is be excellent to each other. <laughs> they really are going to change the world. Party yeah. on, dude. Woo-hoo. See? <laughs> but it's always funny because, you know, that's the positive way. And that's usually how a lot of people, you know, work with non-human entities. And, you know, it's just buddy, buddy, friends, you know. But then there's also the other side of things, you know, just with anything positive that could be negative, like somebody does something stupid like demanding a non-human entity that they have no prior relationship with do something for them. Uh, Ceremonial magician. (laughs) (laughs) Really bad idea. Lester Solomon. (laughs) We got one of those in the woodwork. Yeah, and, and, yeah, you know, you gotta keep in mind, some entities really enjoy torturing people. Yeah, they do. Well, yeah. <laughs> I get people that I ha- I get people that again when I do the class that have accused me of well you know I think it's horrible of you to have imprisoned all these spirits, and I'm like sweetheart try making them do anything they <laughs> don't do. Um, I got one that's hanging around out here right now just because some stupid git decided to wake it up and drum it up out of the woods and send it to do its bidding, yada, 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 and then, you know, was supposedly going to compensate it, and then never did, and actually called it by a name it really, really apparently doesn't like, so I paid it off, and it's hanging around periodically in the backyard, soaking up the rays, not bothering anybody now. (laughs) <laughs> Occasionally comes in for peanut butter and Nutella or whatever else. <laughs> <laughs> These guys, uh, it likes pizza as far as I can tell. You know, not only that, when you like, you know, when you're summoning, you know, like, you know, like in the Go issue, you're summoning it into a triangle and you're you're telling it to do your bidding and everything. You know, that's that's not having a friend help you. That's having someone who's pissed at you help you. 
Yeah. Um, that's huh. like that's like you know if you summon one of these things into a triangle and and you tell it that I I want to be able to sleep well at night from now on. It's like all right, I'm gonna kill your dog. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, that you keep you awake. And, and you want to you know, sleep well at night? Yeah. If I kill you, you'll sleep great. <laughs> yeah, <so I> mean, <laughs> you know that's that's not really the most. But at the same time, it is it is kind of you know it is it's like uh, it's like befriending wild animals. You gotta it's the same basic concept almost. It's a, it's gentle, but you know sooner or later you establish that mutual respect. You know, like anybody that lived in the country, well, you'll know you know when you got animals hanging around, you make friends with them, and they get to know you after a while, and you know their personalities, right. and you can even. Tell a different chipmunks apart because, well, you just spent <laughs> that much time around chipmunks, you know. And dude, I am you know, totally Rick. stoked that you just said that because that's actually what I base a lot of what I do on. I'm, I mean, I've been a wildlife rehabber since I was a teenager, and a lot of the same tactic—I guess call it tactics or strategy—that I use for dealing, especially with injured, f- afraid, pissed off wildlife are the same things that I use when I'm dealing with something when I don't know exactly what it is. And so far, it seems to be working pretty good. So I'm really stoked that you said that. That's cool. And, 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 you know, it's, it's just like with wildlife. If, you know, I know, like, I, I helped, like, you know, me and my, uh, my girlfriend at the time, you know, we, we were um, walking around a lake and uh, a couple of ducks, uh, I mean, one, it was just a bad day for those ducks. The one got, like, a fish hook <laughs> stuck in them. The other oh. one got, like, stuck in some, like, uh, something along the shore, and we had to get them out. And we were just wandering around. We had nothing better to do, so we were just helping out the ducks. And little did we know that these ducks were of opposite genders. And uh, you know, so, <laughs> so, like, every time we'd show up, it's like, yeah, they'd both call, come up to us. And oh. eventually they had a whole family. <laughs> <laughs> and every time we go to the lake, we have like 20 ducks around us. <laughs> oh, I have this head pick now of Dave just trucking along and everything like that. And there's this row of ducks. And Steve Mark in the background somewhere right? going, what to do when the ducks come? I swear to God. <laughs> you know, to, to go off of what Dave said a little bit, though, I mean, like, like with wildlife, though, sometimes you don't need to make friends. I mean, you know... Uh, if there's a if there's a possum around your not a possum a uh, a skunk around your house that's probably not something sorry snooze if there's a skunk around your house there's probably that's probably something you don't really want to make friends with it's something you want to encourage to find um, greener pastures elsewhere away from you so or even better a nice big black bear that used to raid our uh, garbage cans. I got a thing that I put in, um, the again, in the class text. I keep coming back to that, but it's relevant to it. Um, it's some whites want a little respectful friendship. Some, people, some whites want a little respectful, leaving them the hell alone. And that's absolutely, I mean, that's absolutely true. Some of them don't want, part, part of the reason you wind up interacting with them, they didn't get your attention because they wanted your attention. They got your attention because they don't want you there. They don't want to interact with you. And that that's a little bit more tricky to mess with, especially depending on who came first and all that kind of thing. A great key word out of all that is respect. When dealing with things that aren't human, actually with dealing with anything, respect is the best way to have conversation. Yes. Bingo. And that's that's actually the third part again. <laughs> The third part of the class. <laughs> he's doing my he's doing my class like in rows here. It's, this is brilliant. You guys have never even seen it. I love it. I think it's also as much as it's respect, it's also understanding what that entity, animal, or whatever the case may be is and learning to work with it as it is. Um, there was this, you know, there's always a story about the rattlesnake was freezing by the, by the, the lake and says to the, the little native yeah. girl, pick me up and warm me. And the girl goes, but you're a rattlesnake. Oh, I won't bite you. And, she, you know, the dumb girl picks the rattlesnake up and holds it against her, her neck and it, it slowly warms up. And after it warms up, it bites her. And as she lays there dying, she goes, but you told me not, to, you wouldn't bite me. And the rattlesnake goes, yeah. But you knew I was a rattlesnake whenever you picked me up. You picked me up, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's you know, I have, a, 
I have a question. I don't want to go too far down this tangent, but I'm just sort of curious as to what y'all think. You know, the the whole thing about this is, uh, oh, I just answered my own question. Non-human entities. Never mind. I'm going back in my corner. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one thing we overlook a lot in the metaphysical community is just because they're non-human entities doesn't mean that they don't need help once in a while from us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that you're, that those are fun. Um, I get I get into some weird stuff like that. I refer to myself as a roadkill psychopomp because most of what I what I deal with is dead animal spirits. But occasionally I get something that's not, and it's the the flip side of of you know respect and seeking contact out for the right reasons is that sometimes they seek contact out with you because, you know, not because they want to get you gone or get you out of their way, but because they do actually want something. And figuring that out can be fun. And sometimes it's, you know, to me, it, it, it just always feels really, really rude or dismissive to ignore them or not at least try to figure out, okay, hey, what's going on with you here? Because sometimes it winds up being kind of important. Yeah, I think people get intimidated The instead of saying, you know, oh, it's negative energy or it's positive energy. Sometimes the fact that the energy is just strong, people can get really intimidated. And they're like, oh, hit it with a shoe. Make it go away. <laughs> <Make it leave. laughs> yeah, you're, I think you're right. I've you seen, know, I've I've seen people a- respond that way. It is I've very had startling. a lot of en- entities. Some of them are are happy, fluffy, troublemaking em- entities, and you know, most of them seem to be not necessarily malicious, but kind of like the rattlesnake. And it is just what because it is. the energy's there doesn't mean it's like, oh God, it's here to attack me. It's like, no, I just want to see what it's doing and. <laughs> Do help it do what it needs to. It's like it's like that if you've ever had a horse, a really nosy horse, come look over your shoulder at what you and wonder what you doing, what are you doing, and they'll they'll just about knock you over, yeah. trying to be nosy, <laughs> and they don't mean it. It's that they don't really realize they weigh fifteen hundred pounds. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, Winking, you know. Sorry. Okay, Brendan. Um, before I leave, because I have to get ready for work, I uh, wanted to bring up in here is going off of large entities is I know in western Pennsylvania and other areas is you have entities that are basically a controlling entity for an area. And they are sort of like the overseer of that area and the guardians of that area. And you can sometimes take areas as big as, you know, two, three counties, or a half a state if in some of the smaller states, or, you mm. know, just, you know, these are very, very powerful entities. They're not gods. They're not... Like the know, Mothman. Anything. Yeah. Uh, same idea. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, these are... I know around Pittsburgh, there's one or two that go... that have been created out of the blood and sweat and steel and smoke and smog from the steel mills and all of the hard labor that had gone on through there and the heartbreak and whatever else and it had actually created a sort of a guardian entity for that area uh, around hmm. Pittsburgh and I've dealt with a couple of them off and on <clears throat> normally they're not very good to deal with if you have to. Um, normally not making friends with them. They sort of are on their own little level. But, I mean, there's... We were discussing things as small as Fay in your backyard, but there's also even larger beings out there that you can interact with and um, that are not gods and stuff like that. So I just wanted to throw that out there. and I think I'm off for the evening. I'm going to be heading into work. Bye, Brandon. Okay. Night, Brandon. Bye, Johnny. <laughs> Bye, Brandon. We got to <laughs> hang when we go down for the powwow. Well, he already uh, um, called yeah. off, so hopefully he'll have some days off to be able to to sit with us. Yay. But yeah, I've worked with Brandon with a, a couple of those entities, and what's funny is you'll hear 
you know, people will tell ghost stories about certain areas, but haven't had any experience. And, you know, a lot of us joke that I'm a lighthouse because I go in anywhere and things go, ooh, pretty shiny. And <laughs> paranormal things will just kind That's of me like, me with ghosts. Oh. Ghosts find me. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do but ghosts people will go me. in. I'll go in to a ghost walk or, uh, you know, supposedly haunted woods with people who are like, oh, I've never had an experience until they go with me. So, <laughs> I mean, it's it's kind of fun, but it's it's kind of a pain too. Well, by by the way, I, I need to uh, I need to give a PSA on this. If you walk with Amber Lady and Brandon at night, make sure you're not exceptionally sleep deprived. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. No. One thing we into, haven't. Oh, go ahead. I, in, I walk into graveyards, and I can feel that. The ones who are still in residence there know I'm there, and they they tell each other, "Look, there's one who can see," because they know that I'm aware of their presence, and so they so um I'm in the graveyard. They they keep an eye on me, call me around, see see who I'm talking to, and like that. I'm actually used to that. Yeah, we've uh, he's we actually had um, one that. How old is Emily? Emily was born in 1812, died in 1851. She's a very dear friend of mine. Yeah, she actually this last time that we went to Maryland to see his parents, and we usually try to stop by the cemetery and see her because it's it's fairly forgotten. Um, we've asked her, we, you know, like, look, you're, you're forgotten here. Come home with us if you want to. That's fine. And this last time, apparently she did. And she's, she's been hanging around the house and stuff. It's, yep. it, it, they, sometimes all they do want is just a little bit, they, you know, they mm. just want some recognition. They just want some attention and that kind of thing. All they yeah. want is to be remembered. Ghosts. Yeah. yeah. You know, one thing. That, that I notice a lot. It, it's something that I definitely notice, like, the moment I walk into place, is I tend to notice, especially older houses, um, it's not a human thing, but the house itself is is somewhat conscious and aware. Oh, yeah. um, I've, I've, I've been in a house where the, the father actually put a shotgun in his mouth and blew his brains out on Christmas Day in front of his family. And, like, I could walk in, and it wasn't his ghost, but I could feel the house having its own energy and its own opinions and its own feelings regarding. Sure. And I just recently went into um, a house where someone who, who had great intentions and not very many carpentry skills tried to remodel the house. And it was, it was, an, amazing, it was an amazing house, but it, it was so funny because I walked in the house and the first thing I thought is, this house isn't evil, this house isn't you know, uh, you know, a negative place or a bad place to live, but this house is pissed off. Because it feels it's been treated shoddily. <laughs> I've seen that. It's well, you not think... happy about that. And so I, I, I definitely pick up on houses, the energies that they have that just grow from their own age and awareness. That's, it's, not, it's not a human thing. It's just, you know, they, oh. they, they develop their own personality and so forth. Well, they sit there and they soak up some of the most intense energy that anybody produces in their home life. You know, getting angry with each other, being in love with each other, yeah. holidays, that kind of thing. You know, aging, life changes and all that. It makes sense that it would, you know, it would just sort of accumulate and build up and take on something of a character. To me, it makes more sense that it would than, it, than if it didn't. So people invest in that kind of thing. Yeah, people invest in their home. If they feel like it's their home, then in a way, it sort of—I mean, it's sort of an anchor, and there's it's a, not just a place. There's a movie called Allegro Non Troppo. It's an—it's an animated film from the mid '70s, I think. It's this whole series of vignettes. The one Same I'm guy that did Forgotten, for, uh, for Forgotten Planet, uh, isn't she, it? Um, I don't think so, but the one sequence I'm thinking of, what you see on screen is this little tiny 
pussycat walking around through an abandoned house. And as the cat walks and which of the runs, it's these events that went on in the house, like it saw a wedding or it saw a birth or it saw domestic fights and things. And as you watch it, you come to realize that there really is no cat walking through an empty house, but the house is using the idea of a cat as an avatar to remember all these things that went on in the house, all of family that the house came to love. And as this, as this, and yet ends, here comes the wrecking ball to demolish the house. It was a very sad piece. I haven't Hmm. seen that in years. I need to find Hmm. a copy of it. Hey, Dave, where do you begin? <laughs> I'm doing it again, sorry. Working with, I think we've already pretty well established we? where okay. you begin. Um, <laughs> Actually, I think they find you. Yeah. Now, I mean, I always I like, the, I always like the, the folklore story of, and I was trying to look this up, but apparently this must be folklore since I cannot possibly confirm anything related to this story that I heard once of uh, a bunch of, you know, you know, have fun wannabe Wiccans in the U.K., they had the bright idea, hey, if you could bring in, you know, angels and demons and all that into a circle, why don't we try summoning aliens? And so they did. Awesome. And then a couple of days later, a few of them were dead. Um, okay. It's a, little, it's a little more original than the norm. Hmm. <laughs> this could be vote. useful. Hmm? This could be useful dare to throw around. No, well, it's it's just a story. It's a, it's it's just rumor. It's a good story. I I like repeating it because it is a good story. It's a little bit original. <laughs> once. Natural selection. And also I working have... with energies that you really don't know what the hell you're doing with. You know that can do some damage to you metaphysically. I have to use this line. I'm sorry. If you're invoking aliens into a rich circle, I have to wonder if someone was bright enough to say I. I welcome the presence of the East, and the next person says, I welcome the alien anal probe. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to go there. I think I Peter am. had an input somewhere in there. <laughs> oh, Peter had yeah, the alien anal probe. Say... Sorry. Oh, thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Go on. <laughs> I was just going to say that, you know, we're talking a lot about working with these non-human entities and we're talking about it because we are people who have been doing this for a while as if it's always legitimate. And part of my experience is, well, I've had many experiences of working with different beings. I've also had ones that are false. I've had ones that when I really looked at it came from inside of me, something that was going on with me. And if you're really starting in metaphysics and you're starting working with these kind of beings, you kind of got to watch, and you still got to use your brain and see what's logical, and you got to look at your emotions and see what's coming from inside of you, and you got to look outside and look logically. Is there a logical explanation for this? You know, I participate in PCP. If I hear my name coming, I don't know where it is. I'm not going to go right to an entity. I'm going to start with what's going on with me, and I'm going to look at the computer and make sure Scurvy hasn't hacked my computer. You know, <laughs> <laughs> actually, that's Dave. <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna kind of, you know, I'm gonna before I jump to, hey, this is something I need to get in tune with. I've had a lot of things that turned out to not be that, and even as I get more and more in touch, that happens more and more often too, because I'm willing to jump to it being a metaphysical experience, and a lot of times it is, but sometimes it's not. Critical self-analysis. That's yeah, just being smart. That's what I refer to as lab ratting your UPGs. If you kind of, you know, run them through the maze a little bit and see what comes out at the end. How many else I've, um, how many else I've seen maybe witches and newbie pagans do is that as soon as they're aware of a larger metaphysical or paranormal arena that they now have access to, they suddenly imagine this huge network of intrigue and all this backstabbing and things going on on the astral plane that they're suddenly responsible for. 
and they think, I have to be involved in all of this, I have to help with this metaphysical event in southeast Texas, and I have to go astral to help these people in Vancouver, and all this stuff. No, you don't. <laughs> you just barely got your feet wet. Sit down. <laughs> You're yeah, not Power yeah. Ranger. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Work with coyote energy for a couple hours. That'll cure you of that. <laughs> Richard, brother. <laughs> Hail Eris. <sighs> Has anyone tried to? We know. We we know. We accept. We understand that gods are real. Spirits are real. Manifestations made form. Okay, ambiguously. Like um, if enough people put their work and sweat and blood into making a city alive, then that city becomes its own viable presence based on their collective will input. Okay, I'm taking this to the extrapolation of has anyone tried to invoke, draw down, somehow connect with the flying spaghetti monster? I think I saw him. Wow, crickets. Is to connect with the metaphysical spaghetti monster. <laughs> uh-huh. I, I think I saw it. him once. I think my brain's captured. <laughs> I, know. I, know. I bet you who's done it already. Raise your hand if you don't know what that is. <laughs> oh, I, I know what it is. Yeah, yeah. And right when thinking about that, it makes my brain feel like I captured another <laughs> micro black hole from black hole from the uh, hadron collider. So. <laughs> I know I could eat a spaghetti monster right now. I'm kind of hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Touched by watch. his noodliness. Ah, yeah. You better watch his ass <laughs> if I see him on the astral plane. More pirates! <laughs> well, question. You have to think about it, though. Think about this from a... From a if you were a fly... If you were a flying... From the, from the flying spaghetti monster's point of view. Do you imagine sitting, being willed into existence, looking around, saying, "What the? F- I was just willed into existence by a bunch of atheists." <laughs> <laughs> what's my power base here? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What's, yes, what? That. What's my motivation? Bad acting class. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, but that's actually just so weird that it probably now has to come true. <laughs> well, um, stay pub marshmallow man. <laughs> you know, you know, flying spaghetti monster wouldn't be the first religion that was started as a joke, and ended up being a serious no, religion. There's a Scientology. Yeah, dis- <laughs> yeah, dis- Discordians, and then one of the Druid orders, which is like now really, really respectable, actually started off as a college prank. Nice. Yeah. Have you ever Dude. been in a room full of people from the Church of the Subgenius? I was going to mention them. Thank you. Yeah. Not no. on purpose, but they they do actually generate some form of I don't want to call it a hive mind, but they do generate some type of just salt attitude. Yeah. Slack. <laughs> they generate a lot of slack. <laughs> and if you get in the field, it, it does actually affect you if you get if you get into the proximity of the field. <laughs> Mm. So, like, like this discussion has basically stated, open up your world for you to be inclusive of things like flying spaghetti monsters and aliens as creatures that can exist. <laughs> it's all possible. Well, you know, there's no reason to be totally, completely, totally rude to people just because you haven't met them. You know, I'm, a, I'm open. It's all, you know. <laughs> it's, it's possible there may well be Klingons out there. I'm sure those have already been welded into existence. Um, I, I, there's Klingon karaoke, I can tell you that. If there aren't Klingons, then where'd the karaoke come the from? The thing is that Klingon karaoke was actually kind of good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I'm wipe probably, up the phlegm. I'm probably <laughs> skipping ahead here, but there's something in here that says pursuing symbiosis. Now, I know people who who have what could be termed symbiotic relationships with the Fae. Um, which, in my own personal opinion, I think that's a little odd, but, you know, that's just me. Um, what do you guys think about that? 
Um, symbiosis implies that there is a is a mutually beneficial relationship between the host and the in and the in habiting presence, if you will, right? Like having a faith spirit live in you alongside you, or living in the same house hand in hand with a faith spirit helping each other. Um, you, I'm not going to tell. I'm not going to say the person's name on here, but and I'll remind. If you can't think of the person I'm thinking about, Miles, I'll remind you when we get off of here. Um, we mm. both know someone who has an extreme problem with being ADD and having panic attacks and some other things that might loosely be called a nervous disorder, but I don't want to say that because it's probably clinically incorrect. Okay. And working very closely with Faye and almost sort of, which I wouldn't think working closely with Faye would be a stabilizing thing for anybody because usually it's the to me it's the other way around. But never never make deals with Faye. But having whatever it is that this person has on board and has been working with more closely in the past couple of years has actually been a stabilizer. And from the last time I spoke with them, panic attacks have gone down drastically, and the this just sheer nervous energy that I mean can't even sit still wants to like juggle their knee or play with their hands or just you know cannot sit still having trouble having a lot of sleep, getting a lot of sleep it actually seems to have helped with that that's I mean that's I'm not really sure what the Faye is getting out of it other than maybe attention and uh, you know a taxi ride but they they do seem to have one hmm I know who you mean yeah yeah, it's, always, uh, it's, it's always really interesting to see uh, when people establish a symbiotic relationship with a non-human entity, especially something that, you know, something like a true symbiosis, where it's both entities, you know, both, you know, both individuals, you know, gaining something out of it. And it, it's just kind of weird, but it's also extremely, uh, it's, it's like the, it's like having a link with someone you have sex with, you know, it, it's one of those, it can be powerful, and that can be a bad thing or a really good thing. You know, it, it, you really got to do your research on this particular entity to know, do you really, really, really want to be doing this? I mean, it, it, there's, uh, there's kind of, you know, some horror stories in the other kin community of, you know, Lordy. people started out as just trying to start out as a symbiotic relationship, and it didn't quite go that way. You know, it just became, you know, more possession than anything else, and... Things like that can go bad. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I'm one of that's why I usually have the rule we are at rule number thirty seven, do not make deals with Faye. <laughs> <laughs> I used Don't to eat have the a food. <laughs> <laughs> I had a friend in college that his his whole deal was with the Faye and um I love him very dearly and he's still a, a, a friend of mine but man they made him so neurotic any I, dealings I'm, with him made any neurosis just exponentially worse it was ridiculous yeah and we got we got a person that's in the extended community here that kind of wound up with the same thing and it, it wound up being compounded even worse by the fact that this person was using alter, chemically altered states of consciousness to be able to communicate on a higher plane. And he's turned into a batshit crazy lunatic. I'm really honestly, I, I wouldn't surprise me any if I read somewhere that he'd, you know, had been arrested for trying to blow up a large national monument or something. It's you. You can't, and I think part of that is what we were touching on before. You cannot expect necessarily that what you're dealing with is going to think like a human. Your your social rules are not going to matter to it necessarily. And right. I don't. I don't think. But I think Dave's right. People don't think about. I don't think people think about that. They see too much Amy Brown. 
and they really should be paying attention to the fact that if you look through, especially Western European folklore, um, some uh, some Shinto folklore with kami, there's a lot more in there about avoiding the notice of fae or not attracting their attention or getting out of having to deal with them than there is inviting them over for tea. Right. And the, the boss is coming. Look busy. <laughs> I mean, but it's, I mean, that's the thing that I just don't get it. Like, is it just me, or does it just seem like a lot of people are more willing to emphasize the positive experiences they have working with non-human entities than the not so positive experiences? They're more willing to to talk about the positive experiences. Part of it is that I think they're looking for it. Uh, if they talk about the positive experience, it's more encouraging. Yeah. Um, well, they I, don't... Think, I think it was also the fact that nobody really wants to admit when they screwed up. I mean, you never talk about how you screwed yeah. something up. You talk about you did something awesome. Yeah. There's also the fact that you do, we, and I don't know if this is a new age infiltration thing or not. I, I kind of tend to labeling there, but that might not be entirely fair. Um, you got a lot of people that if you try to say, um, I, I've, I've had people I've said, listen, you don't really know what you're dealing with here. You need to be a little more careful than what you're doing. And they trounce on anyone who has anything that they perceive as negative to say as, well, you're emitting negativity or you're putting negativity out there or you're poisoning this with negativity. No, I'm poisoning this with the fact that it's true. But there's, <laughs> Stop there, poisoning with your realism, snooze. How well, it's, you, you know... Logic. It, it cr crunch the apple the witch handed you baby it's tasty but it's it people i think i think that there's sort of a thought thing going around that anything that is not necessarily uber fluffy and light and sunbeams and moonbeams and several other kinds of beams is automatically something that you should pretend doesn't exist because if you do then you're allowing negativity and that's automatically going to make you fail um, there, there's a book about that as far as the corporate America doctrine of um, over po of over positivifying everything, but I can't look it up right now. Yeah, I know there's the book The Secret, and even with Reiki training, the whole idea behind Reiki is there is no negative energy. Any negativity you create yourself, so therefore you are supposed to be open 24-7, to all energy because all energy is good. Uh, yeah, I screw that. I, I, no, I know a couple. Of, I know a couple of Reiki practitioners that if anybody actually said that to them, the first thing they would do is slap them for <laughs> false advertising and for setting people up. Um, we have one that comes to the power that's the same way. He's actually really, really awesome. But most of them are like actually looking into what is common for Reiki. That's it. It's horrible. Yeah, I, I kind of blame that on the same mentality. It's what I refer to as the positivity police. <laughs> yeah, and I, I'm I'm waiting for them to get. Uh, I, I'm waiting for them to get eaten by something large with you know claws and fur. And <laughs> Dude, I think they'll make an awesome skit. The positivity police. <laughs> <laughs> you know what you're gonna do when they come for you. I've, I've actually, I've got it. I've actually got it down. I'm waiting for one person to either move off the continent out of legal, out of range of legal jurisdiction, or to die, and then it's going to screenplay. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I, there, there's this book that I, I think is absolutely amazing and awesome, and it's called Against Happiness. Um, and it makes. It makes the case that, you know, if we were to make everybody Prozac happy and fluffy and light, that we would lose all of the genius of the world. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that's sort of a powerful thing. You know, the people who, who say it's all fluffy and light. And also the people who say it's all, all, all you know, uh, icky and dark. Um, I, I, I think that they're definitely missing something there because, you know... Uh, not only do you not need to embrace everything, because not everything is fluffy and light, but also you don't need to uh, to discount things that are dark, just because they 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 have some some purpose too. Whether it's something within you or or, or outside of you, um, 
you know, there's there's always something to learn there. I I, uh, I once had an entity. I can't tell you today if it was something within myself or outside of myself because I was a baby witch then, and I I wasn't good at telling the difference. But uh, but it was it was dark and it was nasty, and I had to deal with it. And you know, I'm I'm a better person for it. So, well, you get, I, and I agree with you. I think a lot of that. I, I tend to be a little bit prejudiced in the favor of looking at things like that as a yin-yang complementary balance as opposed to the type of dualism that we get brought up with in Western, that's been so prevalent mm-hmm. in Western thinking. The idea that all of one side is good and therefore anything that is not, that is different from it or that is polar to opposite of it must therefore automatically be bad. To me, balance, bad it's where there is a substantial imbalance between yin and yang. Not that one is good and everything, you know, everything on yep. the other side is bad. I think that's where a lot of that comes from. Um, I get, um, we, Nora Cedarwind and I had a talk at PSG about the mentality that we have about death you know, Western civilization, we've we've become a culture where treating death as something that is part of life is something unnatural and is something bad. And, oh, my gosh, it's negative. Um, whoop, did I say that? And well, that's, that's where that comes from. And I think that a lot of people look at, they let that color everything. Here's something yeah. to keep in mind, though. If you're feeling bad or if thinking about something feels bad that's not necessarily a bad thing exactly you may just be realistic i actually had the privilege of watching my mom explain this is going back years when my baby sister died the school i was going to felt it was unnatural that i was experiencing the grieving process at age five Because uh-huh. five-year-olds okay. are supposed to be happy. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Hey, I remember the Land Before there. Time. Do you guys remember that? And at the beginning, yeah. the mama dinosaur died. I yeah. cried for two days. Exactly. I cried for two days, and that was normal. That's what kids are supposed to do. When you mm-hmm. I, I don't get these people who say, you can't take your kid to that movie because the, the lion dies. And I'm like, well, you know, your kid's got to learn about that somewhere. <laughs> See, I don't get it. what horrifies well, me are people that try to hide when the a grandparent dies or another family member dies from a small child and they just tell them, oh, they went away. And I'm like, are you, are you a freaking idiot? Well, He's gone let's, upstairs. Well, let's think yeah. about something now, okay? Yeah. When hmm? addressing all these negative feelings, okay? Let's say, uh, since we haven't picked on Barrett in a while, let's mm-hmm. say yesterday Barrett was a real poo-poo head to Ashley. Okay, and today Barrett feels bad about it. Okay? And Barrett still has his head. Impressive. <laughs> but <laughs> with this example right here, what is it? It's it's a part it's a of you le- saying, hey, I need to dwell on this. It's a learning process. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Your negative emotions are your brain And your psyche's way of telling you that something is not right or something needs fixing or something needs cleaning up or something needs messing with. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some people out there that are terrified of that process. There's a lot of people out there that are terrified of that process. Okay, Okay. and I've, I've seen people who are afraid of pain and their own emotional pain make themselves into complete idiots okay to the point where it is beyond comical where it is fair blog worthy i mean holy crap my mom years back friend of ours somewhat associated with the healthcare field whole whatever it is mom has a stroke all of a sudden she's afraid she's going to catch it Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how college stupid degree you from a Kellogg's have, box? <laughs> how stupid do you have to make yourself 
to use that as a justifier to avoid pain. That's what I love about pagans, though. They don't do that, by and large. <laughs> <laughs> nice qualifier there. <laughs> Actually, one thing I've noticed about pagans, and this also applies to members of some other fringe communities, is that many of us come to paganism after going through deep personal questions and bouts of faith and things with the religion that they belonged to before, and they, there's this long process of self-examination, and they go through all of that, and they, f and they find themselves here. Um, the analogy that I use with members of the BDSM immunity why they can be so so level-headed, well-reasoning people is because they have come face to face with their personal demons. They no longer fear their personal demons. They know what they are, and they sometimes invite them round for tea. That's mm -hmm. about right. Yeah, that's about it. And I think going, getting back to what we've been talking about, I think that exact. And that not wanting to deal with uncertainty, a common, I mean, it's a combination of fear of uncertainty and fear of maybe being wrong or fear of messing it up is one of the reasons why people find talking about metaphysics or things that they can't prove on paper to be uncomfortable. Yeah. It's, that, it's that uncertainty is part of what they can't deal well. with or they don't want to deal with. One, I mean... One, fear of what they don't know, maybe, or what they can't actually necessarily explain. Two, fear of having messed up or having made a mistake by mm. talking about it. Well, you know, I actually got the chance, uh, all, good grief, almost a year ago now, to interview Juan Milo Duquette. And one of the questions I asked him is what, he, what advice he had for people who are starting out in metaphysical work and in magical work. And um, his, his advice was just do it. Because you'll make mistakes, yeah. And you know, you know, the crap's gonna happen. You might as well go ahead and do it and get out of the way and 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 have your learning experiences, and um and not be afraid of anything. He said, and I and I thought that was kind of a powerful thing because, you know, I think a lot of people are are, are a little oh. weary, especially especially when it comes to uh to doing things that are have a high probability of uncertainty. I um, sense more. I'm sorry. Go ahead. He I'm first, little, hmm? Okay, you go ahead. <laughs> okay, I'll jump in. The first car that I learned to drive was a manual transmission, and the first day in the car, my driving instructor is out next to me. I out the car. I drive a little bit. He says, "Okay, now think of um think of um." Take your foot off the clutch. I did. And the car goes, gunk, and dies. And I said, oh, crap. And he said, no, get used to that. That's going to happen a lot. It's okay. You'll, make, you'll do that many times as you learn to drive this car. You have to know what that feels like so that you won't be afraid of possibly doing that. That's really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. I'm I a can't... little. <laughs> Go ahead, Scar. <laughs> I'm a little bit in the opposite camp, though. When I this, it's just me. If somebody wanted to learn metaphysics, honestly, I'd like to tell them not to, unless they know enough to say, "Okay, I want to break this rule." Maybe they don't have a business doing it. But that's just me. Because they won't know if they do or don't until they test and explore their own boundaries, which mm -hmm. are not your boundaries. Well, it's not so much that. I have a belief that some rules are there to be broken. And by and large, for me, for my twisted logic and worldview, it works out pretty good. <laughs> if they don't okay. actually have the cojones to say, okay... Do this guy's rules apply to me? 
And if not, how do I go about figuring that out? Then no, they probably, they, maybe they don't need to be going there. I can't, I think I, have I got your point about, right? Here's the thing about breaking or willfully breaking a rule. First step you have to do is be willing to accept the consequences. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you know that the line in the sand is right here, but if you step over there, there's a dog over there that might bite you, but you want to go over there, you know the risks. Well, yeah, right. but sometimes you don't know that line in the sand is there until you've crossed it, and you're like, oh, yeah, don't need to go past that point. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's, as I said, if someone would ask me, that would be my opinion. It's true that in certain situations, though, that you don't have the choice all the time. Most people oh, have a choice, does. metaphysics or no metaphysics. Some people can get, like, they wouldn't ask spiritually by they what would, on around them. They wouldn't ask somebody in the first place, though. Hmm? Well, then there's a difference between someone I who mean, actively says, I want to study this, I want to learn about this, and someone who gets into it because they keep getting woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning because somebody keeps slamming their closet door when there's no one in the house. The person there's, a, get, there's, there's a difference. Yeah. The person getting woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning, they're already in the middle of it. Exactly. They're, That's why I'm saying there's a difference the person, between someone who just says, hey, this is neat. I want to the try person, it. The person who decides they're going to sit down and study this, okay, they've already made a decision. They're doing it with conviction. Well, um, yes, but I also think that some people don't have a choice. Um, it, Nobody does. Th- hmm? Well, a- but, okay, <laughs> like if you, if you choose to research metaphysics and you read all the books and you do all this and that, um, it might not help you understand for yourself exactly what you might be getting into. And there are some people who don't have a choice. Some people are just born with a sense and an awareness of kind of physical forces around them. They might not want to experience these. Um, like if you've read the well, Anita Blake books by Laurel K. Hamilton, she describes how when she was a little kid, Roadkill would get up and follow her home, and that's how she learned that she's a necromancer, like it or not. That's about yes, right. <laughs> but that's, that's at a point where you're not making a willful decision. Okay, right. and if yeah. someone would come up to ask, to ask her, I want to learn metaphysics. I mean, granted, I can't speak for her. Right. But what are the odds she would say it's a good idea? I think you're oversimplifying it. Yeah. And I think that's where the discussion is getting off is I think that you're you have an idea um, in your head and, and you're not elaborating on it enough for people to get uh, a clear idea of what... Let's take this back to an analogy that Scurvy used when this whole discussion began. What Slavery! If, no, 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 not that far back. Okay, <laughs> thank you. No, if, if blind person A says to blind person B, I'm thinking of getting surgery to have my sight enabled... Would the other blind person tell him not to because he can't comprehend sight? Maybe. That's a possibility. It's all situational. Yeah. I mean, you're dealing with risk. You're dealing with reassessing worldview. You reassess worldview, I mean... Uh, that happens every time you read the newspaper. Eh. Well... Normally, when you read the newspaper, unless it's something tragic or really drastic, it don't really alter the world view. I mean, I think the last one we had as a country we had as a country here in the states was what nine eleven in two thousand one, yeah. and nearly a decade before that. So yeah, say once about once every ten years, twenty years, something like that. That type of paradigm shift, though, is something that happens to almost everybody that winds up coming into paganism 
because that's again that's part of what gets them here is the fact that the mainstream worldview doesn't necessarily work for them or anymore right where they were is no longer working and they're trying to find someplace else that works and if they're trying to look beyond what works then they're trying to broaden their horizons which may involve stepping into the unknown to find a new viable paradigm i can understand that but there's <laughs> when you talk metaphysics i mean if you really come down to it, catholicism has metaphysics exorcism anyone Oh, it does. Speaking of which, but... <clears throat> but there's a I difference. I think that... Um, I, w I was told a, a wonderful quote once. It was, people like their patterns. If it is a painful pattern, is if it is a physical harmful pattern, if the if the choice is easy to change that pattern, they will still stay in that painful pattern because it is safe and it is what they know. Mm -hmm. So, even and uh, on a different side of tangent, you know, we're talking about how people react. I, I found that when it comes to people accepting their surroundings and people going with things and people understanding problems when you deal with somebody who has trauma happen whether it is physical trauma mental trauma trauma medical trauma or metaphysics um they either puff themselves up and go i'm such a, a hard ass i can handle anything because those problems didn't happen to me i can handle anything i can handle this entity and i can handle that entity because i am super awesome yeah, and eventually you come across an entity that you can't handle. Right. So they, they come across as, oh, I'm hot shit. You should listen to me. You should obey me. You have the other ones that are, oh, I've been so down with this, and that's why I'm sensitive. I, I've had to suffer with it. And then you have the ones that are willing to look and see whether what they're doing is a actual experience or whether what they're doing is like we talked about coming from inside them so you're talking about Eeyore versus Tigger versus Kanga right yes if I can take this into the hundred acre <laughs> wood right yes yes the Tao, the Tao of Pooh speaks loud there, there are analogies of every human psyche and every personality frame in different characters in any of the poo. And that's why it fits so well with little kids. It helps them understand that different people work in different ways. Anybody yeah, that's I'm, I'm totally a so who am I? I have one. Hmm? Oh God, you're a donkey. <laughs> <laughs> no. Miles, I, I would like you to listen. A jackass in a hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> I just threw something at your picture. <laughs> cool, thank you. Well, I, I know I'm a piglet. That's that's that's, that's So right. am I. I love piglet. He's he's young, he's he's wide eyed, naive, and he's he's Terrified. just So what's no, Dave? Actually, I want like to try everything. I think Dave is rabbit. Dave is rabbit. I don't Dave remember I don't remember what Winnie the Pooh, so oh, you yeah. should go back to kind of Rabbit. <laughs> Rabbit is the O C D gardener. Oh. <laughs> what would Amber be? <laughs> hmm? What would Amber be? Or who? Rue. Rue? Amber is Rue, Kanga's well, kid. Mm -hmm. right? I don't know, I yeah, kind of I could see that. Kanga. Amber's got some Kanga in her too. You're the Kanga. Gut wrench says I'm the owl. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, the, the, the owl's too now much. Now I'm going it. to ask the question that could break this. What is okay. gut wrench? Tigger. <laughs> Absolutely. 
The most wonderful thing about Tigger is Tigger's a wonderful thing. Actually, it's a spring. They're bouncing, 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 bouncing. Fun, 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 fun. The wonderful thing about Tigger is he's the only one. But it worked, doesn't it? Yes. And that's why someone, oh, years and years ago, and I know, I know you've read this. Someone wrote the, the, Tigger ritual. I have a copy somewhere. You've read that, right? No. It's a, it's adorable. It's a, f- it's a full Wiccan ritual with elementals, Lord and Lady, casting a circle, the whole bit written, well written as if performed by all the characters in the Hundred Acre Wood, and they got all the characterizations right. It's beautiful. That's Look awesome. for it. it. It's, I'm sure, some. it's on some website somewhere. If you Google the Tigger Ritual, you'll find it. I'm pretty sure, certain it's on Internet Sacred Text Archive. Uh, I, I think I read it a long time ago, and it was pretty awesome. It's been on there. I think it. I think you're right. I think it is on there. And this, a lot of people have read the Tao of Pooh, but have you ever seen the Tao of Piglet? The you know, I've got the Tao of Pooh, and I want the Tao of Piglet. It's brilliant. It is so. It is. It's it's fabulous. It's absolutely fabulous. I, I just have to ask, just due to current events, I I, I would like to know, uh, and and he can just answer in the chat room if Gut Wrench has Tigger blood. <laughs> Cricket, cricket. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> We're all waiting anxiously for Gut Wrench's reply. Okay. Got to say, this conversation is a win for Winnipeg. I'm a Winnipegger. Winnie was from Winnipeg. Canadian pride. Sorry. That's uh, okay. It's okay. <laughs> you can has. Yay. Brandon has always associated himself with poo. Hmm. Wave your maple tree proudly. I can see that. <laughs> Guy, Guy Rich's reply is, duh, winning. Ah, <laughs> 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 uh, current events. And on, the off t- and on the off chance, somebody's listening to this from a year, a year from now or something. This is right after... Or what's his name? Sheen outed himself for having tiger blood. Yeah. And how yeah, much coke did he do? Name. I'm sorry. Isn't that, Charlie a, Sheen. isn't that an a tiger blood? Isn't that an, an insecticide brand name? He's no, I'm ki- I'm serious. In his veins. Tiger blood. I, it, tiger, it, I, I think it's an insecticide lot. brand name. I, I I need to go look that up, but I want to say that it, I think we used to sell it at the farm supply. I know it was always my favorite flavor of snow cone up in Pennsylvania. First, I thought he was talking about dragon blood. It's an aphrodisiac in Armenia, isn't it? (sighs) Probably. (laughs) Some people will drink anything. Well, Well, as long as you say it's an aphrodisiac, it's like... Same things are aphrodisiac in other countries. It's like saying something's an energy drink in the U.S. Oh, it's an energy drink. It can taste yeah. like crap, and I'll still drink it. Hey. Pick, pickled curry newt gonads. It's an aphrodisiac. Yeah. And an energy drink. Hey. Hey. <laughs> just so wrong. I think my stomach just turned into a pretzel. So, so cool. we, I saw a guy do that on TV once. <laughs> Well, since we accidentally stumbled into this topic anyway, of it non-human is. entities and ritual. Uh, with the did, ritual. <laughs> nice big way. Yes, very well done. Yes. Um, I think most people that start with this stuff don't realize that entities are, um, shall we say, independent beings. And as such, when you introduce them and you don't know them that well, that could be a chaotic element that you're introducing into ritual where things can go right yeah. or horribly, horribly yep. wrong yeah. uh, we would with a festival that we used to go to that we no longer attend one year they had a they had a main ritual and they invoked was it dionysus mm-hmm. uh all the fae uh, several other like 
it was supposed to be something about the spirit of partying and the spirit of celebrating, and they didn't put them back or close the circle. Uh-oh. And they're like, what, was somebody went to the emergency room with a broken leg, and somebody yeah. else had like a, they That's had to right. like jump them off because they had like a heart attack or something? They had people break out in fights, people falling down, just walking, yeah. just, like, I'm out of here. <laughs> um. I used to live in Colorado, and the big pagan festival out there is called Dragon Fest. Um, a couple of years before I got there, the people who who present the main ritual chose Hatia to let the teenagers write and script and perform the main ritual. Okay, nice. But they didn't check in on them. They didn't examine what they were doing. And the teenagers, being teenagers, were enthusiastic but but inexperienced. And they chose to invoke... Now, there's a whole bunch of... Um, of hormones flying out all over the place teenagers at a pagan festival who chose to call down and invoke and right around the magic chaos that is pan and so they did this and they got pan flying around in all this magic chaos uh, but they didn't dismiss Pan at the end of the ritual, and so all the magic that they invoked was still there, going all over the place, and people who were in long-term relationships, 30, 40 years, were having fights and breaking up, and there were people starting fires for no reason, and people just going crazy, because because no, no one thought to check in on what the teenagers were doing or to rope them in after they got things rolling. Wow. I think it's a great idea. They should do it more often. You would say that. Um, who was it? When, was it about eight of us, Winnie and her sister, and who else? Was yeah, it went back was up to the top of, of the hill. Winnie had a bottle of wine still left in her tent and everything, we, and we went up to the bottle we of, top back, of the hill and poured we, it out. We went back to Ritual Circle, and we formed a minor circle, just the eight of us. We acknowledged Hyanisis and Oberon and Titania and the, and the four elemental aspects of the Fae, like the Undines and the Gnomes and whatnot, and we called them all into circle again and said, Thank you. Now you are dismissed formally. Because the people who wrote the ritual didn't do that. It, they just left it go splee all over the place. Wow. Splee. You know, you know <laughs> as a Wiccan, I just kind of wanted Splee. to mention, you know, and you sort of brought it up with the elementals, you know, Wiccans invoke non-human entities into their circle, like, almost every time they circle. Um, and it's the, the elements and the guardians of the four quarters. They're not human. And, uh... And, uh, yeah, it's just sort of our part and parcel of what we do. But you put them the back. Guardian. <laughs> well, like, everyone who's cast a circle has heard someone say, I call upon the guardians of the watchtowers of the south, mighty phoenix, and so on. And so they're right. invoking a mighty phoenix into a circle. Yeah. Right. But the trick of it is, is that you, I, and I, I say you put them back, and that's kind of pejorative, but... Well, your rule, you rule is be a good host. Right. You're, you're in circle. You send them go thy ways before you break that circle open and restore yourself to a point where you're no longer between the worlds. I mean, I'm not technically Wiccan, but I've served for you on several occasions. And yeah, yes we've, we, we've done stuff that mimics the ritual that we were talking about where we told people, we, you know, we want you... To invite who your patron is to be here with us to appreciate this celebration. And we people have yelled out whatever entity they wanted to invite to circle, and they've been there. Mm -hmm. But what happens in circle stays in circle, and when circle is before circle is no more, everybody goes home. You know, you, we, you know, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. 
and we didn't we didn't have any of this. And some I mean we had somebody that in, we were several people that invoked Pan. We had one person that invoked Loki. Ooh. They yeah. picked up they picked they picked up their toys at the end of the evening and everybody took their sand bucket and went home. I mean, it can be done, but not like that. Well, yeah, I think that's 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 one thing about about Wicca is that when we do this, we don't do it like a you know like a lion tamer with a chair and a whip, and you know, it's not you know you have to be here and then now you have to leave so much. It's it's more of a hey, you're welcome, and hey, it was good to see ya. Yeah, it's <laughs> so, I don't. I, I can't. Y'all come I, back now. You hear? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we, one of the best, best, best circle di- dismissals. Yes. And I can't stand that. I command thee go. I command thee come. That crap. I yeah. mean, if somebody else wants to do it, fine. But I don't want any part of it because these people. These I want these things as at least friends, but on civil terms. Yeah, one of the best, best, best dismissals I've ever heard was by a guy that joined in on, and we we did eclectic public rituals in Freedom Park for five years where anybody could show up, passersby could observe, you know, that kind of thing. Mm. And this guy had never been in circle before. I mean, total, not even maybe baby witch, maybe embryonic or fetal witch. (laughs) Uh, Great guy. He had absolutely no idea what he was doing or anything, but we we were running a little short on people that wanted to step up and call quarters, and he volunteered to call air. And his dismissal, we just told him, Say what you'd say if you were inviting a friend to your home for dinner, you know. So his dismissal was, y'all take care, drive careful, we'll see you soon, bye now. So mode it be. And it was, it was absolutely it perfect. Worked. It worked. The whole, it, it's, it's almost like it felt like something tickled everybody before they left. It was lovely. Hmm. Yeah. See, I've always had entities around me ever since I was little. Um, So I've never quite got the understanding of invoking that it was always to me. Oh, you just say hello. Hey, can you come by? And what is all this calling? What what is all this? But, you know, later (laughs) I learned that I just work different. (laughs) Well, that's, I've I've always said, like, what the hell do I need to invoke them for? I got enough of little bastards running around now as it is. (laughs) Right? Well, to to put that into some frame of perspective, it's like you hang out with your friends all the time. You're always with the same five people. You're a close-knit group. You go everywhere together. So you don't need to have special rules to, rules to interact with each other at all. But in ritual, it's as if you... It's like you hunt yourselves on stage presenting a play for the benefit of other people. So even though it's the same five people that always hang out together, there you are interacting while under the watchful eye of other people who you want to impress and you want to give and you want them to want to associate with you again. So you're dynamic does change a little bit in circle because you're working there with more people or more entities if you can see them or not. That's why I don't work with other people. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, the crickets are typing. Hmm? What Dave was talking about, um, nobody likes to deal with the negative entities. There's this weird belief that entities can't touch you. And I'm not sure where that came from. But... Yeah, well, they can. Yeah, I have... Oh, it's been a couple years ago now, but I still have a scar across my hands from uh, an entity that came to me, and I still don't completely understand what happened. Um, it really felt like somebody had put a a curling iron across my fingers. Like it was a very intense hmm. burning. It was absolutely horrible. 
Um, but it also, I became more in tune with some things. Yeah. So it was a very, very strange experience. But yeah, it whatever she was, she left two long scars, one across my, um, like on my the top of my hand, going along the the bone of my thumb and going along the bone of my forefinger on my left hand. Are you sure it was a she? Mm-hmm. Hmm, okay. But they're like, oh, no, as long as you cast protection, nothing can hurt you. Oh, no, they can hurt you. It doesn't matter how gifted you are or anything like that. There is always something that is bigger and badder or just more resourceful than you are. And yes, they can do physical damage. Plus, well, when you invite them in, invite something into the circle and be like, I'm protected because I'm in the circle. So is it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have this, it's like I have this demon which manifests as a giant tumor on my hand. I'm going to cast a nine foot protective circle. Or, uh, around myself to drive out the to, oh wait it's still on my hand <laughs> the battery, you don't have a hand yeah oh. right <laughs> yeah nobody takes logic one-on-one anymore <sighs> sad how true that is mm -hmm. But that comes back to cause and effect, and people don't play play with that anymore. Yeah, I I gotta agree with you there, and I think again what you were talking about a minute ago, it's people don't necessarily they they don't think that there's any consequence to their action, and I I don't know if part of that is because they don't really believe in all of this stuff, or because of I could start an argument or debate or whatever about the last couple of generations of denial, you know, complete and total denial of responsibility and all that. That's another ball game. But I, I, I think that might actually be part of it, too, is that people don't take it seriously because they don't see any reason why they should be responsible for the blatantly material actions that they take trying to get them to understand immaterial actions that might happen is just further down the road that was a bit rambly did that make sense it yeah did. it did it yeah. did it um, just reminded me why i don't like most of the people in my peer group that's all <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, honey any 12 people that can't get out of jury duty are not my peers <laughs> I'm people who get into Wicca or get into magic and things may well be hunting into it on the one hand but still skeptical on the other hand and so they may cast a circle and do all these things but at the same time, the other hand is thinking, oh, this isn't real. It's all just make-believe and hocus-pocus. And so whatever I say, it's okay because it's all fake anyway. And so they, so they invoke all these names and things they saw in a book somewhere. And they don't want to acknowledge that there might be some reality to what they are doing because they refuse to acknowledge that there is any legitimacy to what their skeptical mind is denying. And it's kind of tricky, a tricky deal there, too, because on the one hand, if you don't believe anything, then you're one of those people who doesn't believe anything. On the other hand, if you're so open-minded your brain falls out and rolls around on the carpet and gets dog hair all over it, you're not really any better than the person, you know, that's, that's gone the uh, complete other polarity. It's moderation in all things. I invoke, I invoke nihilism. Oh, yeah. I yeah, love go those with people that. who don't... I just cleaned the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I love those Welcome. people that don't believe in anything. Yeah. And that, that, no, that no, is a perfect opening. To me. 
<laughs> well, that leaves me a perfect opening to mention in and in, in dudism nihilism is, is like like <laughs> completely inappropriate um yeah. you know I, someday someday dudism i want to be great. in the play version of that and play nihilist number two <laughs> the dude abides um there's <laughs> and i take some comfort in that <laughs> here here there's a line in a movie and i can't think what the movie is where some young you sees a bunch of philosophers talking about the meaning of life and how do we really know that we're here? How do we know that anything is real? And she says, well, start by imagining that until you're not here and see how far that gets you. That sounds like something Terry Pratchett would write. It does, doesn't it? I love that man. Our if he didn't write it, I think he should. Mm-hmm. But I know that it's something that um, I struggle with because, uh, like I said, I was I was always around strange entities, and if you're the only one that notices them, and even people who say that they are pagan have no clue what you're talking about and you're just way off your rocker and then you and only it, it was until I met uh, Dave and Ashley and Brandon and Clarion did they go oh yeah I noticed that too well see that's what I do with my stuff it's again it's that lab rat in your UPG thing I take I've got an ongoing study that I do. One of the reasons I do the class is because people seem to get a kick out of it sometimes. The other reason I do it is because I'm using them for guinea pigs. If I have a UPG of dealing with a white, and I've got, I've got some that are pretty darn weird. Um, yeah, I mean, you've heard about a couple of them. If I get something really, really peculiar, I go bounce it off of someone else who in my experience, has some good psychometric stuff going on that I know doesn't go all, fruit, either all fruit fluffy or all, you know, got everything's got to be freaky blood, you know, guts all over the place. Somebody that's got some good middle ground. Um, and I see what they get out of it or what they get off of it. Um, I've got one that really threw me for a loop that, in the past, what, three years, I've put it to close to five dozen people, and all but three of them have, then they, these are people that don't know each other, different times, different places, and they've all gotten the same general response out of it. And what you were talking about a minute ago, about people that don't normally have walking in the woods experiences going off with, you know, someplace with you, and then boom, mm -hmm. that rule changes. I chalk that up to the same type of thing. It's when when you run into something and someone else picks up on it or gets a bead on it, to me, that's, that's hitting that middle ground between skeptic and believer. Plus, it's fun to hand people odd things and go, here, go sit in the corner with this and tell me what you get out of it. <laughs> Especially if they don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't do anything like that ever. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> right, Scurvy? No. Oh. Actually, this kind of it is kind of fun to uh, take an atheist to spooky places, so I do have to admit that. <laughs> Figure out whether they're good day atheists. Hmm. Atheists in a foxhole? Here's... Well, before Scurvy goes off on a tangent, I realize we've used this term for the past two hours and have yet to define it. Uh, can we define the term white? Because I don't think we've ever used that show on the, the, the sorry on that the show before. That's I'll kind be of I G H T. Yeah, it's a now that's a little bit idiosyncratic for me. Um, that's you'll you'll hear some people refer to land spirits as land whites. I use the term as a blanket term that could cover. Anything from uh, Vatir, which is the term they use in Heather and Neosotru, 
to kami, which is a term they use in Shinto, to the little people, to the fae, to the spirits of dead animals. Anything that is a spirit entity, whether it was alive or not at one point, and whether it's – most of the ones I deal with aren't human. They're, they're animal or some other type of non-human intelligence. And I use white as a catch-all term for anything that might fall into that category. Um, and the word um, that I used earlier, anchor, uh, anchor is the word that I use for any physical object that a white seems to use as a point of interface or a point of interaction with the material world. Okay, well, where's my cookie? Cookie time. <laughs> I already gave you cookies. <laughs> No, oh, they're supposed to give me cookies. I just like stood and delivered. Yeah. Oh. I'm not sure you want Dave's cookies. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm ding. Yeah, insert joke here. I, I, I know for some reason I just. Hey, I, I trust Dave's Dave. cookies more than I trust Brandon's cookies. Okay. I just don't see Dave as a bacon type personality. I really like. I really like baking, actually. You do? Yeah. I can see Dave baking well, actually. <laughs> I demand evidence. Dude, fine. Then, um, do you have an oven in your RV? Yeah. I have an oven in my house. <laughs> I'm going to bake some brownies. Okay. Cool. Score. Brownies. Yay. And then we can no have. PCP crap either. It's real regular store-bought brownies. <laughs> PSG is going to rock. We're going to have brownies. <laughs> Yay. I want to go. <laughs> Brownies need chocolate frosting. Okay, we can get that too. Hell yeah. It gets in their hair. And you know what? We can get some ice cream to put on it too. And before we're done, we're going to have like a 12-layer cake. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand now chocolate what Chocolate frosting man... gets in your hair? <laughs> no, you in, never... in the brownie's hair. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> what are you doing, <laughs> I'm not sitting close enough to him to actually, like, visit any type of GBH on his person. I'll take care of that later. Oh, by the way, I was listening to the previous episode, and I am very much in a pro-GBH um, camp for <laughs> it inducing uh, enlightenment. What's GBH? <laughs> Grievous 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 Grievous. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You remember. Yeah, now I do remember. My name is Stu, and I'll be your GBH provider today. Ask me how. <laughs> Yay. It's like an HMO, but for pagans. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I can't tell the difference between that. I can't tell the difference anymore. No, no, no. You're not going to drown me in paperwork after you bitch slap me. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the difference. What's the difference? Paperwork? <laughs> Being bitch slapped. I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing. It. I'm not seeing a real difference there. I'll take two of the latter if I can avoid her first. As I, see, this man has his priorities in order. I don't know. I just think the conversation in the chat room is incredibly interesting. So I really haven't been paying that much attention to the conversation. Sorry. <laughs> Do we have more topics? There's a chat room. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. He's on Skype. He might be willing to to Skype in and talk. Let me about let me, it. let me paste the link to the chat room in the Skype room. Okay. Well, we've been at this for two hours. I think it's time for final thoughts. Let's do final thoughts after these messages. And we're back with final yeah. thoughts. Thoughts. <laughs> Final thoughts. Uh, I'm pulling on my shoes. Dude, winning. <laughs> and my final thought is when dealing with non human entities or any entities, respect is key. Period. And peanut butter and Nutella. Yes. When you, can't, when you can't do anything else, what's Nutella? <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, Nutella? you don't know what Nutella is. Oh, it's it. chocolatey hazelnut goodness. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's like it's like peanut butter, but 
made with hazelnuts and chocolate spreads, sort of. It's good. Very tasty. Yeah. Anyway. Noms. Hmm. Sounds like that'd be good on brownies. Oh, it's bloody great. Yeah. It's good on anything. Well, okay, not broccoli. <laughs> Have you ever tried it? Yes. <laughs> Don't ask. It's not pretty. I've learned, I really have, that if you eat chocolate M&Ms and raw cucumber at the same time, the combined taste is like eating raw bread dough. Mm. Yes. My final thought comes from the chat room. Beware <laughs> the dragon lures. <laughs> Wow. I'm sorry, I know what you mean, but in I my wish head, I, was I just, just got this little shiny dragon on a fish hook. <laughs> that was very intentional. <laughs> Hang on. Final thoughts. I'm trying to surmise or create some kind of viable final thoughts to this evening's discussion. Um, I actually think you're right that non Amenities, the best thing is to treat them with respect. Um, treat them... Actually, a good analogy, I think, is to treat them like family members that you've heard good things about but don't really know that well. I like that. You know? I like that too. Yay. House guests. There you go. Like, see? You feed them. <laughs> My final thought is that I find non-human entities far less trouble than the human ones. You're here. Yeah, you don't get in trouble. Well, you do get in trouble, but it, it's worth it when you swat those ones with the, on the nose with a newspaper. Real humans tend to whine a lot and <laughs> go for legal action. That becomes a problem. Or, or go emo on their Facebook. Or go emo <laughs> on their Facebook. <laughs> My final thought, I think we finally made it through tonight without talking about a felony. <laughs> Are you sure? I might have spaced out there on it. It's a possibility. Well, somebody apparently in the chat room said something about good on brownie. I'm assuming they're talking about Nutella. Said good on brownies. <laughs> oh, no, about... never mind. I'm sorry. I forgot. <laughs> what about on Girl Scouts? Does that count? I mean. I'm sorry. I forgot about that. Okay. No, we didn't. I'm my bad. <laughs> what felony did we go into this week? <laughs> Pedophilia. Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> You know, this is going to have to be officially added to the PCP drinking game. <laughs> Four shots for every felony found. <laughs> <laughs> the felony four. <laughs> wow. <laughs> 14 against 20. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Amber, Amber, what's your final thought? Did you have one in here? My final thought is, instead of being optimistic or pessimistic, you need to temper your experiences with realism. Whether it's good realism or bad realism, the universe holds both, therefore you should as well. Epic win. That's good. Alright. So, we're going to do something interesting for the next two weeks on PCP. I'm handing the show over to Scurvy and Amber for them to do with it whatever they want. For the next <laughs> few you won't recognize the place when you come back. I'm going, I'm going to another continent while I'm doing this. <laughs> Buy the liquor. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully planes will still be permitted back in the country when I plan to come back. <laughs> <laughs> if any volcanoes erupt or you all just shut down airspace, I am, I am seriously going to haunt your asses. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to turn off the internet. <laughs> hey. <laughs> so, that, so that's what's in store for the next two weeks of PCP. We really don't know. <laughs> we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. So that's it for this week's episode of PCP. Join us next week for roulette. <laughs> oh, and Magnus Infinatus, if, probably for the next two weeks, if you want to listen, you're going to need to Skype up. 
No, no, Scurvy, I'll totally give you the credentials to our, our Ustream account. In fact, I'll give them to you right now. <laughs> dum, dum, dum. Why me? <laughs> Alrighty. All right, that's it for this week's episode of PCP. Have fun if there is a next week's episode of PCP at this rate. <laughs> oh, crap, Miles Donna who gut wrenches? No, I don't, actually. Uh, Gut Wrench has a podcast over on Tenacity.com called The Gut and Bone Show. He deals with a lot of the paranormal rather oh, okay. than pagan. Funky. Gut and Bone Show. Okay. Mm-hmm. I had never heard of that before, but that's okay. Very good. Uh, take your anti-anxiety meds. Oh, me? Before you listen, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, I hadn't. I'm answering when you say, you what? <laughs> <laughs> Played for a fan. <laughs> <laughs>